All right, uh, up next is Matt from WebSense, and he's going to be talking about exploit spotting. So let's just give him a hand here. <laughs> Bigger hand. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to talk about uh, exploit spotting and locating vulnerabilities out of uh, vendor patches automatically. So uh, let me introduce you uh, myself first because this is very rel relevant what I'm going to talk uh, talk today. So my current employer is WebSense Incorporation and I'm performing some malware and exploit uh, detection. And my former employer was EI Digital Security and I developed IPS security product there like five years. And I did vendor patches regularly over there. So you will know why I had to like the, uh, the vendor, patch, vendor patches. After all, I was just uh, like a uh, software engineer there, but I still had to like uh, diff the vendor patches there. So, and also I found some vulnerabilities like MS06070 RPC vulnerability or CA arc server, and I used uh, just stating method to find that kind of stuff there. And I also developed uh, Darren Grimm, it's a binary diffing tool, and it, it was a kind of weekend project. And at this point, I want to give you a, a simple question here. Uh, do you really believe that if a patch is out, uh, every security problems will be gone? So whenever there are some zero days out, um, most people talk about the patches. When the patches is out, or like uh, just like the LNK, like uh, a zero day this time. People always talk about the, what is that the patches. So next week they will release patch or yeah that kind of stuff. But do you really believe that if they release the patch, everyone will like a patch patch their system immediately or within a day or two days? Uh, my answer is no, actually. So let's uh, let's look at config one. Uh, it was like a spread like uh, uh, 2008 or 2009 and actually it used a vulnerability like a patched uh, at least a few months ago. So even though the patch was out, most a lot of people didn't patch for some reason. And uh, the config worm like uh, infected more than 8 million uh, computers over the world. And how about the driver exploits? They only include, uh, they usually include uh, one day exploits, the exploits that has patches. But there are some zero days, uh, but they are very rare. And how about the meta exploit and core impact and canvas? The exploit pr frameworks uh, usually not about the zero days, they are about the exploits for the like a vulnerabilities that has patches usually, or they gather the information from PLC code actually. So let's talk about exploit, uh, exploit and security product. Uh, by exploit, I I'm talking about the PLC and exploit packs and drive-by exploit and ex exploit frameworks like uh, Metasploit, Canvas, and co Core Impact. Uh, exploit frameworks are also security product for testing. And by security product, I mean antivirus and web filter and mail filter and IDS like a snort and IPS and vulnerability scanner like a retina. You remember, anyone remember retina here? Yeah, a few of them, uh, a lot, yeah, actually, from EI, actually. So retina or, yeah, that kind of stuff. And basically what security industry is doing is uh, creating signatures for vulnerabilities. So they have matching signature for each uh, matching vulnerabilities. So even vulner vulnerability scanner has their own like a signatures for every matching like a CV number or something. So the what exploits are doing these days are like uh, using obfuscation to evade all the signature systems like IDS or IPS. And like if you look at some JavaScript uh, exploits, you will see some 
like a random byte there. You will never see the direct, the explicit uh, exploit there. So this is all about uh, evading the security product. So I mean, if you find uh, some vulnerability that has been patched but is not known to the like a uh, security vendors, then it might be very serious concern because many systems uh, doesn't patch for some reason and the exploits try to evade the like IDS and IPS system but if they find the attackers find one day exploits they can still like exploit the system like by evading the IPS and IDS. Uh, for example, uh, if there are some product system like uh, selling some stuff like uh, they are, if they are running some IIS and they have like uh, a lot of traffic there, if they like uh, need to, if they recycle the machine, I heard that uh, it takes more than 20 minutes. I'm not so sure why it takes more than 20 minutes, but it's a lot of loss for them, so they will not turn off the machine every month. So they will do that like uh, every three months or six months, and there are some time frame the attackers can like use one day exploit to like own the machine. So you might wonder there are like a real example that uh, has been uh, a problem past in the past. So I gathered some like expo uh, examples here like uh, uh, first one is MS07004. It was a VML issue and the patches were out but nobody wrote any exploits about that because they didn't have any information about that like a vulnerability. The vendor just released the patch and they just released advisory saying uh, we like a patch is something wrong inside the VML module or something like that and that was it. But a guy from like uh, uh, Korea, actually he's my friend and he used my tool to like uh, reverse the patch and wrote the, uh, the exploit in few hours. And the second example is MS08067. Actually this, uh, this one was used for Configurum actually. So uh, his name is Steve, uh, Steven, uh, Steve Ridley. Uh, Steve Ridley. Uh, uh, actually he used my tool. He also used my tool to like diff uh, the patches and create the exploit like uh, in few hours. Uh, you can look up the uh, blog here and you can read the whole story. And the next one is a very interesting one like MS10024 and this is uh, a kind of uh, undisclosed uh, uh, vulnerability from Microsoft and they were releasing patches for other vulnerability and they included some undisclosed uh, like uh, vulnerability patches inside it. And Actually, it was caught by Core Security Lab here. So, yeah, it's a little bit uh, like embarrassing. So you can know that why binary diffing matter here. So uh, the first, uh, you can use binary diffing to create exploit. Like uh, if you have POC, you can just use that, like uh, to put your own shell code or like uh, make it more reliable. So you can use that as a template for your exploit. But if you don't have any POC code, then in that case you need to figure it out yourself. Maybe you can get some information from the vendors, but I don't believe any vendors will like uh, release any like a uh, technical information to like uh, any uh, exploit writers. So the only way I think is using binary diffing, and maybe. Uh, Maybe people start uh, start to look into like binary diffing. Maybe the Metasploit arsenal will increase by far now. Maybe I'm not so sure. But the other use uh, for like binary diffing is actually uh, generating signatures. So with the same technology, you can create exploits or you can create defense uh, mechanism or something like that. So. So IPS and vulnerability scanner or even AV uses uh, like a signatures for like uh, detect the binaries, the attacking binaries or attacking websites or like uh, exploits. So if there is any POC they can use 
that POC for their like uh, signature template or something. But if there are no POC, then where will they get the information? Uh, only vendors. So uh, there are some vendors. Vendors actually provide that like uh, actual technical information, uh, like Microsoft. Uh, they have a program called MAPP. You can just call it like a map. So, how many people heard about map here? Uh, yeah, looks like not many. Yeah, it's always like not many. Yeah, under 10 people. So, looks like it's not that popular now. But it was launched. I remember like two years ago at Black Hat. So, it's been two years, and they provide real like a real technical information to the like uh, security vendors like uh, maybe yeah our company also get that information and all the like any security vendors that are like uh, willing to get some information they can just contact the M map like a uh, uh, coordinator and they can like uh, uh, get sign some document maybe and they can get the information every like a patch tuesday or Whenever there are some zero days are out, they can get the information. They send it through the mail, and you can get the information like uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, but if you don't have that kind of luck to have map, then patch analysis is the is the only way. And there are other problems. Like uh, even though you have the map, they still doesn't disclose the information fully. They still hide some information and. Uh, like uh, they only write just one vulnerability in their report, but actually, if you dip the binary, you can catch that they like included like more than four or five other maybe uh, sometimes like one or two vulnerabilities in their patches. Uh, the one example was that one that I showed, like MS10024. Uh, that one, that one was caught by Cole. Uh, so. Uh, let's talk about the binary dipping tool itself. Uh, there are some limitations with the current binary dipping tools, like a bin diff or other, like um, patch diff too. And there are also turbo diff, and darren green, and uh, that is my tool. And there are like uh, four major uh, dipping tools out there, and but there are some limitations. And there are two of them I, I just wrote here. And one is like uh, managing files is a very very like a boring job. So if uh, the Microsoft release a patch, like they include like um, so for example 12 patches, then there are like uh, because they p like release patches for every OSs or something like that, then it will include like uh, uh, maybe 40 or 50 different binaries, and you need to manage all the binaries, and you need to find the old binaries for that matching binary. So it's uh, kind of very time-consuming and boring. So sometimes it takes more time to find that old binary or something like that. So it's very time-consuming. So the other problem is that how do we know which function has security updates, not like a feature updates? So sometimes they include just feature updates or yeah, something like that. I will talk about this later. So I wrote uh, uh, upgraded Darren Grimm, and it's uh, Darren Grimm 3 now. It has a web interface, and it's very user friendly, and it has a bin collector. It manages all the files for you, and it has a security implication score that shows what function has more security impl implication inside this. So you can know what function has more probability of having some security related patches inside it. So the security implication score itself is based on signatures. So there are some patterns like uh, appearing like in the security patches. And there are some noises like uh, each for like uh, eliminate, eliminating some like uh, noises caused by like a feature updates like uh, they didn't patch it uh, they didn't like uh, didn't patch any security related problems but they did like uh, just uh, upgrade some functionality or something and that kind of thing or they can do some kind of code refactoring and or they j just change it the optimization level and they will that will create a lot of false positives also uh, the disassembler is not a like uh, 
uh, disassembling itself is not like a deterministic problem, so uh, there can be a lot of problems in like uh, recognizing some code parts or data parts, and it makes a lot of false positives. And as I said, security implication score is a signature-based uh, scoring system. So something like a string length, you can use st string length to like uh, patch some kind of uh, what is that the uh, stack overflow. So you should use string lengths to fix that kind of problem. So it will, it should appear in the patched part. So how about the safe string API? So something like uh, Microsoft SDL, like uh, they recommend using like a new API, new like a new safe string related API. So in that case, they should use a safe string API to fix the old problem. So you will find that like uh, uh, safe string API from the patched part. So you can use that for like signatures for locating uh, security related patches. Or about some like a constant numbers, some big numbers maybe to fix uh, some integer flows. So this code is written in Python and uh, it's in Python so you can just rewrite the part if you have your own logic so you can just rewrite, rewrite the part and you can test it yourself. So the actual question will be, uh, is it working or not? So I have an example. I have an example here, like acroaudi32.dll from Adobe, and they patched, uh, they released 9.3.3 recently, a few months ago, and I diffed, diffed uh, 9.3.3 with 9.3.2, and it created like a three. Uh, 3,630 entries, like uh, modified functions. So it's uh, almost impossible to go through every functions to find the security patches. So uh, if you use SIS, the security implication score here, then if uh, the, the entries with number zero, the score zero is only 900, uh, 692. And the score more than one was only 70. So you can like uh, uh, save a lot of time and effort here. So I will show you uh, how the how Grimm 3 looks like. Okay. So this is the main page. Actually, I'm running some background like a web server, just like Metasploit. They use some web server to like run some their own process or something like that. So I just use a web, uh, like a, what is that? That one is Cherry Pie. I just use the Cherry Pie Python module to run the web server, and you just connect to like a local host. You can like designate like any port you like using like a configuration file. So in this case, it's 80. So you just connect to like a local host like this, and it's just, just main menu. And it only has four menus here. And if you click here, yeah, files import. Uh, and there are some input box here. So here, you, you don't have any files yet, right? So you need to like import all the files from like a remote machine or your local machine. So if you want to collect some, because I'm running Windows XP right now, if you want to like collect all the Windows XP system files, you just uh, put like a C Windows here, or maybe you can use your C program files, anything like that. Then it will collect like a uh, copy all the files to your like. Uh, Library, so you probably need a lot of hard disk, like uh, uh, 20 or 30 gigs, uh, like uh, storage space for that. And or maybe you can set up some virtual machine and you just install something there, and you can just uh, like uh, share some directory there, and something like this. Or you can just import all the files from the remote machine, and in that way you can collect all the files and binaries from other machines or. Uh, for like uh, other operating systems. So it takes some time, like uh, 20 or 30 minutes. And after that, if you click files list, 
the system will parse all the information from the like binaries and version from the files version information, and it will like sort all the files like according to their uh, company names and like file names and everything like that. So here's the all the company names that uh, are installing the like uh, binaries on my system. So probably you might be interested in Microsoft Corporation. So click here, and it will show every file from Microsoft Corporation. So I used an example from like a NetAPI 32. This is a kind of a RPC DRL that is exposed through the pipe. So it has some history of a lot of vulnerabilities found like a, from like a five years ago or six years ago. So we are interested in that file. So we just find the file here, and you go there, and actually it will show every file that has uh, that name, that has that name. So here you have all the, the file, netapi32.dll with that name with different versions. So you can see, so, Maybe you can just want to diff the latest one with the previous one, like a 5.2605694 uh, with the previous version, like a uh, 3462. You just click it. Uh, the like a left one here is the previous file, and this one is the like a patched file. So you just click start diffing here. It takes some time, like five minutes or something, because it will launch IDA. Uh, you need actually IDA, like IDA. I used uh, IDA uh, 5.6, so probably if you are like a reverse engineering guy, you probably have IDA. So you can use IDA, and it will locate the IDA, and it will launch the IDA and generate all the information and gather the on all the information for you. So. After that, uh, the result, it will take five minutes. So I just created uh, some examples here. So in this case, it is one of the examples. So after that, it will like uh, generate some table like this. So you can see there were only two patched uh, functions. And you see that there, there, is, uh, there are security implication score here, three and two. And probably three is bigger, so probably this uh, function has some patches inside it. So if you click it, then it will uh, show uh, uh, some uh, tables like this. So from the table, the left side, actually left side empty, right? So actually the start is here. So left side is unpatched file, and right side is patched file. So it means that uh, the first, the red block it means that the red block has been inserted to new uh, the patch. So it means that they, can you see this? Like, uh, actually, it's calling WCSLAN here. I'm not so sure you guys can see this. It's a WCSLAN here. So actually, the patch is uh, patching the. F uh, vulnerability using like a calling WCS lane. So you can actually see uh, what the actual programmer did uh, to fix that vulnerability. So it had like a stack overflow and they fixed it by just calling WCS lane from the start of the function. So, so this is a, some table view here. So this is left side, if something happens in left side, it means that they removed that code block. And, and something happens on right side, it means that they inserted the new blocks there. So you just need to like look into red block or like, uh, there are also yellow blocks, but there are no yellow blocks here. So yellow block means the block has been modified. So maybe I can find some example here. Yeah, there are some yellow blocks here. So in this case, uh, yeah, it changes some logic here, so it's uh, recognized as a kind of red block. So anyway, so you can click open IDA menu here. So you can actually use IDA to see the diff result. 
So in the in that case, this is the old binary for same function. So it's a nap man, nap nap p manage IPC connect here, right? And if you see the graph overview, it doesn't have many thing here, and there are some. Uh, red block here, so looks like they uh, removed uh, this block from the unpatched uh, binary. So it shows two IDA. The next one is patched uh, binary. So you can see that they inserted new blocks here. And because it's showing the red block here, right? So it means that they inserted new blocks like this one and this one and just three. and. The first one contains that call like a WCS LAN. So actually, you can use IDA to the perform the actual analysis because it's uh, more comfortable to the reverse engineers. So this is the demo. Oh, not this one. Twenty-five. So let me show you some e signature examples here. So I just talked about the signatures, right? So. It's all about the signatures. So what kind of signature are you talking about? I just talked about string lengths or some constant number like a GRX, FFF, something like that. But uh, beyond that, what kind of signature can you use? So this one is uh, uh, MS06070. And you can see that the vulnerability is in here, SWPrintF here, right side. right? SWPrintF is uh, accepting some uh, uh, data from a ARG0, and actually, this function is exposed to through RPC interface. Uh, so the user can control ARG0, and the, it can just uh, direct uh, straightforward uh, uh, stack overflow. In that case, uh, this is the example that I just showed uh, NAPI manage IPC connect, and just as you see, it's using WCS LAN to fix the problem. And you can know that you can use a string length or WCS LAN or that kind of string length check as a like a uh, what is that the signature for buffer flow. So what about what about the other like a stack overflow like MS zero eight zero sixty seven? This was used for config room, right? So it has three entries here, and the first one has a security implication score twenty. And you see that uh, I'm not so sure you can see that, but this is a uh, string CCH copy W uh, API. This is a new API introduced by Microsoft. So it's a safe string like uh, API or something like that. So whenever they c like uh, Microsoft patches any string related uh, problems, they are going to use this uh, these new secure. Uh, APIs and we can use that as a kind of pattern to locate the security patches. And this is integer overflow from MS10030, and it is uh, the problem inside the Microsoft Outlook client. And if you use um, like a what, uh, uh, like a Darren Green, you can see that uh, I sorted. By security implication score here, and you can see that the first entry is uh, like a response uh, start uh, method from CPOP transport. Looks like it's uh, processing some response from uh, POP3 server. So, if you look into that, uh, you can see very uh, interesting like uh, call inside it. Uh, actually, I'm not so sure you can see this. Uh, it's uh, API U long long to U long. So each uh, API that converts a 64 bit integer to 32 bit integer. So you might wonder the original prom problem was integer overflow, and they are using 64 bit to 32 bit 32 bit conversion API to fix uh, like a to uh, fix uh, what is that integer overflow. So you might wonder why why it is working. So before they, if you track the input for the conversion, it's coming from actually string to INT API. And the buffer for like a STL to INT API is coming from like a pop3 re response, uh, like a header, like a re response line. 
So it's it's like attacker controllable. If the attacker is running some fake like a pop three server and like a, like a, what is that uh, hijacking some like a, a, like a wireless traffic or something like that, then maybe the the attacker can control the user's machine own the user's machine. So you might wonder why the uh, Microsoft engineer used the long long to you long uh, function to fix uh, uh, integer flow. And not just comparing some like integers. Uh, that's uh, it was because it is recommended by SDL. Uh, like a U long long to U long API is actually converting 64 bit uh, integer to 32 bit. But it fails if the original 64 bit value is greater than maximum 32 bit value. So any Value that is greater than 32 bit maximum value will not be converted. It will just return error. So they are fixing the problem just calling this API. They don't need to like use like uh, comparing the uh, integers or something like that. They just need to use uh, this API. So whenever they fix the integer flow, then they will use probably use this API because it's recommended in their guideline. So maybe you can just use uh, this as a kind of signature to like uh, find any kind of uh, integer flow from like a uh, Microsoft. So you might wonder uh, from the list of the functions that has been modified that patch, they only talked about like one or two, uh, like uh, CPOP3 and IMAP, but it actually shows a lot of like a uh, meaning meaningful entries here. So you might wonder they might be hiding something here. So I just dig into more, and looks like uh, the other uh, uh, the other method, the next one, like a CI map for agent uh, here, resize and message sequence number table, is uh, fixing same problem. It's calling the old one was just calling the memory allocation routine, but the patched one was calling you long long to you long just as they fixed the other integer flow. So it looks like whenever they find uh, some integer flow they are, uh, from their module they are fixing same kind of problem from other code parts. So that is not related to each other but looks like the programmer, actual programmer that is uh, responsible for that code just learned that kind of technique or that kind he might not know about integer overflow before and somebody reported and somebody like us from the security team maybe they talked about it and he's educated maybe and he fixed the other problems with uh, other parts of code that has same problems. So he fixed uh, the code in other parts with the same method. He's calling you long, long to you long to fix some integer overflow here. So this is very interesting uh, problem bug because it's very hard to exploit. So looks like uh, the server, the fake IMAP server should return like uh, uh, more than like a few, like one gigabyte of data to maybe a few gigabytes of data to the client. So it's not likely to, likely to be exploitable but it's, it's still uh, like a uh, 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 security problem. So it looks like they fixed it for their reason but looks like they don't talk about it. So they just they just fix it, but they just don't talk about it. So, and let's see next example. So next example is about uh, uh, the use after free bug. Usually, this is very popular in the Internet Explorer these days. And I found that uh, I did a uh, patch for CV 2010-0249. And I found that they are using a lot of a lot of code to replace PTR. So it's a small here, but actually the red box there is containing some replace PTR code there. So this is also the, that pattern happens a lot in the code. So left side the left side is the original code, and right side is the patched code. So they are calling repla replace PTR. So this is the reference, cross reference from like a uh, unpatched uh, code. And replace PTL is called only from six places. But from the patched code, uh, they are calling uh, a lot of replace PTL. So it looks like they are all related to some kind of event processing. So, so 
I looked looked into replace PTR function. So looks like it's just about replacing pointer. So the name uh, tells everything. So it's just about like a replacing pointer, and looks like the old code was uh, like now replacing the pointer for some reason, and it made like uh, some problem like uh, use after free because the like uh, invalid pointer was still there and it was not replaced for some reason and yeah it was causing the kind of use after free so maybe you can use a replace ptr string as a kind of signature for like a future uh, same if someone just find the same bug maybe they will use same like a replace ptr to fix that kind of problem so maybe you can use that api as a kind of signature for like uh, uh, that problem, and there are other things I found. Like uh, the original one, it's a method inside the C markup, and it's a destroy play tree or something like that. And actually, the original one uh, looks like the name implies that it's uh, destroying some like a memory structure or something, right? So the original one was just calling man free, so it just destroy the memory whenever it's called. But the patched one. Is calling uh, C tree node release method, and if you look into that uh, method, uh, if you can read uh, some uh, disassembly, then you can know that uh, it's doing some kind of reference count check. So it's decreasing the reference count, and if the reference count is not zero, they just return and looks like somebody is still using me or something like that. So uh, it will not free the memory. So when it, when the reference count to uh, reaches zero, then you will free the memory. So looks like, uh, as I told, maybe you can use replace, replace PTR or mem free or other patterns uh, for like a uh, use after free bug. So let's talk about another use after free bug. Actually, this is uh, uh, the number is CV 2010-0806, and actually this. Uh, vulnerability was used for like attacking Google. So it was like a few months, like almost six or seven months ago. And uh, the if you look into it, maybe some of you already look into this exploit code. So it's from the wildlife uh, like uh, exploit code. I just uh, guess take out some very important part. And if you look into that, um, it's uh, it's adding some behavior here, the default user data. This is a very important keyword here. It's uh, adding some behavior called the default user data. If you look up MSDN, it will show every like uh, behavior that is available for Internet Explorer. So this is one of them. So uh, the attack only meant for this behavior. So you must use this string here. So and it's setting attribute. And this is the key. The S is the key here, and window is the value. And in place of window here, it's meant to use some string here. So you are like uh, uh, setting some attribute uh, using some string. But in this case, the the attacker was setting attribute using some object, and it's a very ser serious problem here because uh, let's see this first. If I diff uh, the patch, you can see that they patched two method here, and both of them has same patterns inside it. And there, the pattern is like this one. There are some change inside the variant to change type ex call, and the original one. The variant change type ex uh, takes a first and second argument, and first one is a destination, and second second one is source. So they are just changing the type of variant uh, object, variant uh, type va variable, from source to de destination, and they are using same one, and it will destroy the original like uh, data, and it will cause what is that the use after free bug, and they are fixing it by. Uh, just using different argument for destination, so they are just allocating some local variable, and they are using it for like a like a destination for a variant to change type ex. So this is a very good example because I never know, I never knew about this uh, variant to change type ex issue before I diff uh, this uh, uh, patch. 
So you can actually learn something from the patch because now, now I know the variant change type EX can cause some kind of memory uh, corruption error. So maybe if I do some kind of other like a code auditing or something, something like that, then you can use uh, um, no, use this knowledge for like uh, that kind of stuff. So in this case, uh, there are very interesting stuff here. Uh, like uh, because there were only one exploit out there, but they patched two methods. So what does it mean? It means that they patched something silently without letting people know. So I tracked down the one method they patched was C persist to user data, which probably linked to related to that what is that default to user data behavior. But the other one was C persist to data peer, and I traced back where that, met that like a class is used and actually it was used by default to save history and default to save snapshot behavior. So I could create some other uh, exploit uh, using that knowledge just in like a few hours because I need to figure out how to use that behavior. I grabbed some example, examples from the internet and I just changed it to use some uh, some set attribute for like a document or window object, not something not string. So it was like a uh, very easy create new exploit. So I think no no IPS or IDS have their patterns inside them. So somebody is a very like a malicious intent. Then they can just create some kind of this exploit and they can evade. Uh, the IPS because they don't have the like patterns inside them. So this is some kind of, but this was patched like uh, almost half a year ago. So I think, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's okay uh, or something like that. So in this point, uh, there are something to think about. So probably MS could just release that information like, uh, oh, we also have like a default save history and we also have some problems in, inside the default save snapshot and also as I showed like we also have some problems inside the IMAP client and it will offload if, you, if the, the attacker returns a lot of entries. They could just write about that in the first place but looks like they didn't do that. So even though they are trying to provide some programs called like a MAP, MAPP, looks like they are missing some information for some reason, maybe intentionally or by mistake or something like that. Uh, so looks like uh, it's not a good like uh, uh, good behavior like from like uh, because like uh, what is that the security vendors should def all the binaries themselves, even though they have MAP. They can't trust the map because map doesn't include some valuable information for some times. So I showed the first one was caught by Core Impact a few months ago, and I showed two examples here from Microsoft. I only showed two, but I have might find more if you look into more like uh, patches. So it's a kind of just uh, uh, problems for security vendors not having the full information. So let's uh, talk about other things. So this is about exploit spotting. So uh, there are some other problems like uh, even though you have diff entries, so exploit writing might be very hard because something like uh, Adobe Acrobat, uh, I did test with some Adobe Acrobat patches and just I said it will create, uh, generate a lot of patch to list or something like that. Uh, I used uh, like a cool type example here and it created like a th more than 20 or 30 entries. So uh, actually they said they patched just one uh, like a uh, one vulnerability like a CV 2010-2204 and I used uh, some public e exploits out there I n and I pinpointed the exact uh, function that was patching that problem. So it is the, this entry here, the red box here. This one is actually that one, CV 2010-2204. 
Then how about the others? Like, uh, looks like they fixed a lot of problems, the other problems here. So, looks like they might have found uh, similar problems in other codes and looks like they patched it. So, with the original exploit code from the, like, uh, exploit DB, you never hit the other, like, functions. So, how do, how can you hit other, like, uh, functions and how can you make exploit for them, even though you don't know anything about cool type? So I used uh, this method called the mini code recovery test. So I just, uh, uh, let me show you. So here's the method. I just Google random PDF document from the, like, uh, all the places from the internet. And, like, I make some library of the PDFs, like, more than 10,000 or something like that. And you execute. Adobe Acrobat Reader with some breakpoints inside it. Like, uh, uh, from this deep to list, you just need to, like, uh, from, I used the unpatched one, so you just need to look into one, two, three, four, five, six, eight points. So you need to breakpoint eight points of the, uh, cool type that DRL to see if the sample is hitting the point to see if it's using any kind of cool type related code there. So you just put like a point of breakpoint uh, to Adobe Acrobat, and you just run the like uh, something like a fudging test. You just execute Acrobat for every files, and you if you hit any breakpoint there, it means that the PDF document contains some template that you can use for your like a uh, testing. So actually, I didn't use uh, debugger, but I just used. Uh, uh, assigned some debugger as a kind of JIT debugger, and I just uh, replaced some bytes inside the cool type .dll to like uh, uh, bring up debugger. So I just put 0xcc some the exact point like a point. I find that and just do that, and it's very fast or something like that. And after that, like if you run something and you can collect all the like a PDF samples that is related to that one day exploit. So, and after that, usually the PDF documents are like a compressed. You can use a PDF TK tool to decompress the uh, PDF documents. And uh, you can actually see the actual the memory that's showing up in the, what is that, the debugger is appearing inside the actual PDF document. So you can just find that actual byte from the, what is that, the PDF template and you just modify that template and you can trigger that crash condition or that kind of thing. So this is very easy to achieve or something like that. So within a few hours, uh, by diffing the binary and collecting some PDF document and using the mini coverage method that I su suggest, you can create some real time, real like, uh, one day exploits template or something like that within a few hours. So I found that what I tested is all about the out of bound memory access. So I'm not so sure it's exploitable or not, but maybe you can just use this method to like achieve other uh, one day exploit writing. Uh, so this, the mini cover code cover test was attempt to use uh, a dynamic method uh, for binary diffing. So how about state analysis? How about you, can you use state taint analysis or something like that for like binary diffing? So I was trying to write some tools to do that, like uh, tracing all the variables back to and see if it is like uh, taintable or not. Uh, looks like uh, it is very hard job. Looks like uh, there are some issues like C++ issues. If the code is using C++, it's very hard. Uh, like uh, to like trace back all the va variables, and 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 there are also if the binary is very big, uh, usually it generates incomplete disassembly list. So I was just trying to make some attempt to write some static analysis tool, and it was called IDA Tracker, but looks like it's not releasable right now. But I'm still working on that kind of code, and maybe sometime it will be combined to like a binary dipping tool. And yeah, it looks like in a few months, maybe, I'm not so sure. So I, I did some attempt, but it looks like it's not working very well. So 
conclusions here. Uh, Binary dipping can benefit uh, IPS rule writers or AV rule writers, anyone like that. Or also, it can benefit some exploit writers. Like, uh, if you are interested in like writing some exploit modules or something like that, maybe you must start with binary dipping. So in that way, you can find something nobody ever like found. So, and there are some typical patterns inside uh, patches, so you can use that for like. Uh, uh, to benefit uh, binary diffing itself. And it is uh, called the security implication score in uh, Darren Grimm 3, and it helps a lot. And you can use dynamic analysis or stating method for binary diffing, and looks like dynamic analysis is b very helpful in like uh, writing some one day exploits. And any questions? Looks like, uh, not sure. Oh, uh, yeah. So looks like we have Q&A room over there. So anyone have any questions, come to the room and uh, ask your questions to me. Thank you. <laughs>